A warm welcome to everyone this Sunday morning. It is a wonderful privilege and honor to fellowship with you. Thank you to everyone who's made it to our morning and in-person service. We have a service at 8 a.m. and we have another one running at 10 a.m. Um, all COVID protocols observed, we can accommodate 650 worshipers. So it is just beautiful to see everyone here this morning. A warm welcome to those connecting via our live stream. My name is Fundiswa Yuba, and I am married to Masimba, who is a curate at St. James, and we work at Red Post Church. It is my privilege to fellowship with you on this our Thanksgiving month, 53 years that God has blessed the work that St. James is doing. So this is just a wonderful honor for all of us to be here together. Let us all pray together as I open the service. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can gather as believers. I'm so grateful that we live in a country such as South Africa where we can freely come together, worship and honor our Lord. I pray that you would soften our hearts and our spirits this morning so that we would be open to the prompting of your spirit and receive your word that Mfundi Simasango is bringing for us. I pray and ask for all these things in the mighty and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. If you would stand up with me so that we can worship.
James, are you awake out there? I think this side of the room is awake. There was some nice, uh, nice praise going on over there. Hi guys, good morning. Um, I think we should do that again. Yes, we've woken up. Well done. Let's praise God properly. Let's do it. Let's give it all our hearts. Let's let's sing that again. Come, let's go. 
Isn't it amazing to be back together with this many people in the room? What a joy. And isn't it amazing to be raised from the dead? We are living, living, and we are not dead. Isn't that beautiful? We are children of the living God. Let's sing Death Was Arrested. Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My open heart was given a name. When death was arrested and my life began Oh, oh your grace so free Watches over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your grace
then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. And that's when death was arrested and my life began. Let's pray together. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the sacrifice of the cross. Thank you for all your promises throughout Scripture that came true so that we can cling to the promise of eternal life. Thank you that we can live in the light of these truths, especially the fact that those who love you are forgiven and are your adopted children. But sometimes, Lord, we don't find ourselves living like that. Instead, we find ourselves thinking and saying and doing things that we should not. We take just a moment now to consider the last few days and to ask you, Lord, to draw us closer to you and the life that you want us to live. We do want to glorify your name. We do want to be witnesses to the truth in this world. We do want to hold fast to you. And we are sorry for our transgressions, Lord. Please help us to live as your redeemed people. School holidays have arrived, and so we ask, Lord, for some rest for the families that have been contending with another tough school year. Anxiety or <coughs> anxieties are raised. The pressure is on to complete the curriculum. There's uncertainty of how the school system is going to function under this added burden of COVID going forward. So we bring before you all the parents who must provide stability and model godliness for their kids. Help us to lead and nurture our children in the light of the gospel. We pray for our children who must make sense of a world that sometimes doesn't make sense. Keep your hand on them, we ask. Keep them safe from straying from you. We pray for godliness to be the hallmark of our families, whether it's going well or whether it's going tough. And may your kingdom reap the benefits of your people sharing your love with one another. And <clears throat> this is the first week of October. This is the month that we intentionally remind ourselves of your generosity to us. We're so grateful for your provision for each family in this church. We know that many families are facing financial crisis, and yet, Lord, you provide. We ask for your help for the sake of the gospel and for the love of our people to remain generous to your church and to one another. Everything we have comes from you anyway. So please help us to honor you in the way that we use those gifts. Thank you that we can come to you and speak with you like this. What an honor and a blessing to be heard by the living God. So we pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, thank you, Gerald, for praying for us. And as we move into our new segment, there are just two items that I wanted to highlight for all of us. Um, just quite moved by the song that we sang. And we've got, just for starters, beginning. It will start on the 12th of October. So if you would love to give the gift of freedom to people in your life, that is a wonderful course that you can recommend and refer them to. It's going to be running for seven weeks. And we're just going to basically cover the basics of the Christian faith. Um, if you would like to get more information on this, please send an email to info at stjames.org.za. And this Friday, the Quarterly Connect 
was distributed digitally. If you haven't received your copy, there are some outside in the foyer. Um, and we've just got a wonderful interview with our treasurer, Philip Van Vleck, um, and that would just be a wonderful overview of how St. James is doing financially and how we've done over the last, I think between 2018 to 2021, there's a beautiful comparison of our financial standing in there. And now I would like to call up Amy, who's Gerard's daughter, to come read the Bible for us. Hi, my name's Amy. Um, like Cindy said, my dad is Gerald. Uh, I'm in grade 10 here at St. James, um, or at least I partake in the help here. The reading today will be from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and 8. I'll be reading from the ESV. That's Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and 8. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. This is the word of the Lord. Now, I'm not Pumezu Musangu, in case you're wondering. <laughs> it's lovely to see you, dear friends, and lovely to see more and more of us in the building. Uh, remember, 650 is the magic number per service. Uh, our building has uh, accommodation for 1,300, and we can therefore, on the 50% rule, have 650 people in the building. So there's lots of space, safe, it's wonderful to have you here with us, all of you. And if you haven't yet uh, crossed that invisible line of getting out of your jammies and back to church, this is the time to do it. And of course, birthday month especially is the time to take that opportunity. We love to see you back. We've got all sorts of things planned, um, so don't miss out. Come and join us. It is, of course, lovely to have you if you're joining us online, and it's a real privilege for me to welcome my brother Pumezu Masangu to our pulpit. Just for those of you who are new to St. James and who don't know Pumezu, Pumezu is a member of the faculty of our theological college, George Whitfield College. He's also the rector of Christ Church Kailicha and has been involved in leading that work. It's a partner work of ours, just like Red Post up at the university, Christchurch Kailicha in Mandela Park um, is a partner church of ours. And um, it's a great joy to have you here. Please will you welcome Pumezu as he comes to speak to us. Is the mic on? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, that's not me in the picture there. <laughs> I wish I was that handsome. Um, greetings, my brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we were in Kailicha, you were going to say, Amen. Amen. Um, it is such a privilege for me uh, to be back here at St. James and to be sharing God's word with you, um, seeing many familiar faces of friends uh, here, perhaps except for Clive Alfino. You know, he promised me that he would roll out a red carpet here and I don't see one. Um, so he must be disciplined after the service. <laughs> um, it's good to be back here, brothers and sisters, and uh, many of you will know the partnership that uh, St. James has had with Kailicha, Christchurch Kailicha, for many years. And we thank God for your support, for your prayers, for your giving. And some of you have been to uh, Kailicha, and I invite many of you to consider um, visiting us when your schedules permit. We are going to look at Hebrews chapter 13, 
uh, verse 7 and 8. But before we dive into these two verses, let us pray and ask the Lord to help us. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the privilege of being called your children. We want to thank you that you have given us not just life, but life eternal. We want to thank you that we could gather today in person and celebrate that our Lord rose from the dead and that we are called his children. We pray now as we are going to look intently into your word that you may help us understand it. And by understanding that we may be able to do what it says. And we pray that you may continue to transform our lives into the likeness of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. We are looking at these two verses today. Uh, but before we look at them, it will be important for us to kind of remind ourselves of what the author of, he of Hebrews has been saying to his audience from the first chapter up to this point. Uh, many of us have read um, this letter. Others of us have preached it um, a few times. But it is important to keep in mind that what the author has been doing is that he has been showing his audience the supremacy of Jesus Christ over many people whom we will list just now. He has been showing them how great Jesus Christ is compared um, to anyone they are, tempting, they are being tempted to go back to. He has also been warning them against drifting away from Jesus Christ, against falling away from him, against jumping a ship. So if you read or if you remember in chapters 1 and 2, for instance, we can see there that Christ is better or greater or superior to the angels. The angels were some of God's messengers. Uh, uh, they, they brought the message, for instance, to Moses when he brought the law to the people of God in the Exodus. Jesus is portrayed here as being better or greater than them. If you read on in chapter 3, you will notice that Jesus is being compared to Moses. And Moses was a big deal to, to the people that he is writing to here. But he comes and says to them that Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than the other prophets. And he continues in the fourth chapter uh, following to portray Jesus as greater than the priests of the Old Testament. He is a better priest. He is the great priest himself, greater than the priest in the line of Aaron. He is, he is the priest in the line of Melchizedek. And he continues, if you read chapters 8 and 9, for instance, to show the superiority of Jesus Christ as he shows how his uh, covenant is better and greater than the old covenant, how Jesus Christ's sacrifice is better than the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament because his sacrifice was once and for all theirs. They had to repeat time and again, but his is greater. And the, when you read chapter uh, 10, you will notice that the author calls his hearers to respond by faith to such great truths as he has expounded from chapter 1 up to that point. He calls them to respond by faith in the light of the superiority of Jesus Christ. And in, in, in chapter 12, he elaborates on that faith. He, he defines it in the first verse, and, in, and then he goes on to list a number 
of people uh, who are found in the Old Testament who are what we may call heroes of faith, people who walked by faith, people who believed the promises of God, even though some of them were not fulfilled during their own time. Yet they kept their eyes onto these promises. In chapter 12, he turns the eyes of his hearers or his audience to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of, of our faith. And now as we come to chapter 13, he concludes his address. He concludes it by, by a few exhortations. Uh, it's, it's interesting to note that even though it's a, it's a book that has been divided into chap 13 chapters, um, he, he refers to it as a short address to them. <laughs> so maybe we need to extend our time of preaching. <laughs> but I'm so glad because Mevin didn't tell me how much I should take when <laughs> preaching. And we normally joke and say that um, uh, white people have watches, but Africans have the time. <laughs> white people have watches, but they never have time. They, they are always in a hurry. Sorry for those who are recording. I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a very polished preacher. So, <laughs> so in chapter 13, we are seeing what we may call some application points of what it means or of what it looks like practically to believing in faith to Jesus Christ, to believing by faith in Jesus Christ. And in these verses that were read before us, verses 7 and 8, we are seeing the writer calling his audience or his hearers firstly to remember their leaders. He says in verse 7, remember your leaders. In case maybe some of them are not believing that it is possible to live the way he has explained to them, in case they are thinking that human beings are not able to do this, the author is challenging them to bring to their memory the leaders. He's saying to them, do not forget your leaders. But we must ask ourselves, what kind of leaders is he talking about? Because as we know, e even in some churches, there are all sorts of leaders. Some are greedy, some abuse their power, others took what, they are not, what is not theirs. Some are voted, some are being appointed, some are self-appointed. What kind of leaders is he talking about? Which ones must they remember? He says in verse 7, those who spoke the word of God to you. And it could be that these leaders are no longer with them at the present moment that perhaps some of them may have moved on to preach elsewhere, or maybe they have been called by the Lord. But he says, remember them. Remember those who spoke the word of God to you. In other words, those who instructed you faithfully in the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, not every leader deserves to be remembered or to be actively brought into the memory of God's people. But it is those who spoke the word of the Lord to them. He says, remember them, recall, bring to your recollec recollection their memory. Have it set in front of your minds. He continues to say, consider the outcome of they are way of life. They recall to their minds, or they must recall to their minds, the manner, the lifestyle, the behavior, the quality of the life of these, of these leaders. 
They must think hard. They must bring to memory how these leaders not only spoke the word of the Lord to them, but how they lived their lives before them. How they were exemplary in how they lived their lives. He says, consider that. Consider the outcome of their way of life. Consider the fruit, or if you like, consider the legacy of both their message and their lifestyle. Keep that in mind. He is talking to people who are being pressured to go back to their old ways. People who are being pressured by others who say, perhaps, come back to our religion. We've got angels, we've got priests, we've got sacrificial system. You, you have a faith that does not have none of those, any of those things. Come back to us. He is saying to them, Jesus is superior. And he illustrates and points to them how they should look to their own leaders. Because faithfulness to Jesus Christ has been demonstrated by them through their message and through their lives. So he says he, they must recollect the legacy of these, of these leaders. We may ask ourselves, but for what purpose? Why is he saying that they must remember and they must consider the outcome of the lives of these leaders? He answers that question by saying, and imitate their faith. They must remember these leaders, the message that they preach to them. They must remember these leaders' lifestyles in order that they might imitate their faith. In the midst of all difficulties, perhaps including persecution, he encourages his hearers to imitate the faith of the yesterday leaders, those who walked by faith before them, those who proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. He is supposing that the life of the leaders that spoke the word of God to them is consistent with that message that they spoke to them. He's supposing that they lived by faith. In other words, they lived by the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, which they preached. You see, my brothers and sisters, there is no room here for Christian leaders who say, listen to what? I tell you, and what I do is none of your business. Sometimes there are leaders like that who are so brilliant in what they say, but who are so awful in what they do. But the author of Hebrews is saying to them, look into the lives of your leaders who spoke the word of God. He is saying a similar message to what Paul said to Philippians, um, chapter 3, verse 17. He said, they join together in following my examples, my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as models, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Keep your eyes on them. Imitate them. Emulate their way of living. And as we think about remembering our leaders in our own uh, country in South Africa, allow me to tell you about one such exemplary leader from our own shores, from KZN. A leader whose character was godly. Because you see, the New Testament has qualifications for Christian leaders. And most of those have to do with character more than ability. And one of those leaders is Nicholas Bengu, who was born in 19, uh, 1909 and died 1985. You see, he is one of those characters who are not well known or whose story is not adequately told in the history of the South African church. 
But if you read closely, if you study closely his life and his ministry, you will realize that he is among the few who have been used of God in great ways. He is a man who, when he became a Christian at the age of 20 or 21, his life changed, and he was sold out for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He sought to live for it, and he sought to preach it. He was a man who was passionate for the continent of Africa. He wanted Africa to be saved. He understood the problems faced by African peoples, including South Africa. But he was convinced that the message that will bring solution to the problems faced by Africans is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are talking here about a life totally sold, sold out for Jesus. We are talking about a person under God whose ministry was so impactful that hundreds of churches were, were planted. Thousands responded to his message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're talking about a man whose lifestyle was that of integrity. It was consistent with the message he preached. He lived a holy life. He persevered great suffering. A story is told of how he, he, he started a, a revival around the farms, around Rustenburg. And when one night he was coming from a revival meeting, uh, walking with his wife and his child, his child died. And he and his wife emptied their suitcase and, 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 and buried the child in a suitcase. They were about to bury her along the road, but thankfully a farmer came and, and, and offered uh, them a piece of land to bury their child. That funeral was attended by the two of them. And they continued afterwards to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to point people to the hope that is found in the gospel. You see, one of the greatest revivals took place in the Eastern Cape. Bengu had started preaching in 1938, was preaching in KZN and in in Gauteng, but on January 22, 1945, he arrived in Port Elizabeth, Kabecha, today, and he preached the gospel there. And it is said that there were Christians, uh, after hearing his message, they became Christian. They got converted. Their lives began to be transformed. They were mere churchgoers, nominal Christians before, but they heard the transforming message of Bengu about Jesus Christ, and they believed it. Even their pastors became Christian. <laughs> Why are they laughing, Mervyn? <laughs> um, in East London, when he, and, and churches, and some churches closed down because people realized that they have been playing. They realized that they needed to go and listen to his message. When he went to East London, uh, they refused, the authorities refused to open the halls of the city for him, so he went to a dumping area where they dump rubbish. In his course, it's called ATP, and he was using a loudspeaker to proclaim the message in Duncan Village. And a revival broke out there where many people became Christians, thousands of them. The, the, the revival was so impactful that it is said that crime rate decreased in East London during those years because lawbreakers, criminals, thieves became Christians. Police officers report how almost on daily basis 
Nicholas Pengwood walking in their doors, uh, bringing a number one or wanted criminal who had become a Christian and now is, is, is a sign of repenting. He's bringing himself to the police. It is no wonder that in 1959, the Time magazine referred to him as the Billy Graham of Africa. He's the man who was used of God throughout Southern Africa, not just in South Africa, but also in the neighboring countries, because he was passionate for Africa. If I knew how to lead the song, I would sing to you one of his favorite songs, which said, Africa back to God. We are singing, we are praying for Africa to come back to God. He, he was a man who never allowed such success to go to his head. No, he was a humble man who never let the success, these successes make him a proud man. He was a humble man who identified with the ordinary people. When one of his young pastors discovered that Nicholas Peng, who had taught for a year uh, uh, in, in Birmingham, in, in UK, at the Birmingham University, in one of the colleges that was called uh, o, uh, Se o Selk Oak Colleges, Selly Oaks Colleges, Peng, who told him not to tell anybody that he was teaching there. He didn't want people to hold him in such a high view just because he had taught um, uh, in England. He was a simple man who never manipulated the poor, who never took money from them in order to enrich himself, but he was a man who spent money in order to support the poor. He was harassed uh, oftentimes by apartheid officials who were suspicious of the large crowds of black people that were gathering around him. He was sometimes misunderstood by anti-apartheid activists for not involving himself in party politics, yet they did not realize how he supported the dignity of black people, the restoration of the dignity of black people. He's, he came up with schemes of education to, to educate them. He came up with schemes of, of supporting so that people can support themselves with businesses. Even though there was harsh criticism from his hometown where he was rejected by the church he grew up in because of the message he was bringing, the message of the new birth that is to be found in Jesus Christ, he never complained. He left his home rejected and continued to preach across the country and across the, uh, the Southern Africa. He is a man who, even when he was, was criticized within his own movement, he stood firm in the message of Christ. He took no personal gain but he is a man who generously gave not only his money, but his time and his life for the cause of Christ. I appeal to you, my brothers and sisters, to remember him, to remember Nicholas Pengu, to observe his, his life. You can read about him. I'm sure if you go to the internet, uh, some material may come up, there is, there is a book by Mapanga. Uh, the title is called A Man Fully Yielded to God. It is a good summary of Pengu's life. The other one by Dab, who was a, a sociologist who studied the, the, the revival in East London and wrote a book that was called A Community of the Saved. And there's also a recent PhD on him uh, by Pastor Lipoko, who did an extensive study. Uh, the, there are many other materials that are starting to emerge on Nicholas Bengu. I plead with you to consider his life, to remember that he was a mere human being, a fallen human being, 
but who had faith in Jesus Christ and who was sold out for that message of Christ crucified as the hope of this continent. His whole life was a life that was characterized by loving and serving Jesus Christ. He believed in Jesus Christ because, you see, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ doesn't change. He is the same Christ that was preached by the author of Hebrews. He is the same Christ that was preached by Nicholas Pengu. He is the same Christ we should preach and live for today. And he will be the same Christ forever. When temptations come, when pressure come, when destruction come, when there is temptation to fall back or to drift away from Christ, we must remember that Christ is the same yesterday, to, today, and forever. He is perfect. He does not change. He is trustworthy. Let us hold firmly to him. Let us refuse to be swayed by messages that are contrary to him. Our hope can only be found in Jesus Christ. And we must thank God for the leaders whom Christ raised and who we can emulate today after we have observed their own lives. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the leaders who spoke the message of Jesus Christ to us. There are many of those whom you have used in our own lives here. We also want to thank you for the, like, for the life of Udad Nicholas Peng, a man who was humble and used of you so greatly that even today his impact is still felt in the corners of this country. We pray that we may bring to memory such leaders like him and that we may emulate their lives to the glory and honor of your holy name. Amen. I'm sure that on your behalf, um, you'd want me to say a very big thank you to Pumezu, not only for pointing us to God's word in Hebrews, but also for reminding us that some of the great heroes of the faith are found right here on our great continent and in our country. Bishop Frank Retief wrote a book on Festuk of Enjera, who was a martyr, a great Christian leader in Uganda in the time of Idi Amin. Some of you will have seen that. Frank had a great hero in Billy Graham, an evangelist, a man sold out for the gospel. But on a number of occasions, as I've had an opportunity to talk with Frank, he said to me that his great hero in South Africa is a man called Nicholas Bengu, who I'd never heard of. And Frank had seen the work in the assemblies that this man had done as an evangelist. And as we begin our birthday month, dear friends, I am reminded of those great words that lay in his heart, Hamba, Evangeli, Hamba. Go gospel. May the gospel grow across our land and across our city. And in this new season, may God use us as a local church for that same gospel. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. Let's sing together.
see greater. When I see that grave, I'll see Jesus. From death to life, I will sing your praise. In the wonder of your grace. When I see that cross, I see freedom. When I see that grave, I'll see Jesus. From death to life, I will sing your praise. And the wonder of your grace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. May our thoughts, words, and deeds reflect our faith. Have a blessed week, everyone. Amen. Amen.